Hello and welcome to Reason Tea. I'm your host, Zoe Silvers Jones, and joining me, of course, is my co host, Miss Kim Lowe. Hello. We continue our re evaluation of the filmography of Mirazaki as tonight we move on to Kiki's Livery Service, um, a standout title in the Studio Ghibli cat- back catalog, and one which also start- marked the start of their 15 year collaboration with the Walt Disney Company, who would produce the also memorable um, celebrity voice tracks, which, with the terms of uh, Kiki's Livery Service, is one of the few dubs that can be considered superior to the subs as we're obviously getting to a bit later in the this episode um but this is a animated fantasy film uh based on the children's novel the same name by ikio kanedo um who was actually kind of upset when the film came out because mozaki's vision for it differed so greatly from her her book and a more faithful live action version was would be released in 2014 where she would serve as the narrator um since then the uh, two have reconciled their differences um but the film that we have here is probably one of the more charming films on the studio ghibli back catalog and this is a studio which has produced numerous whimsical movies with this certainly being one of those movies where you have even like tough guy anime fans who just like ultra violent go nagai movies and they still proclaim their love for Kiki's livery service. The film itself uh, sees Kiki, who at the age of 13 is following the age old tradition of leaving home and setting out on her own for a year in the wilderness. Um, and having believing that she's found the perfect night to do this, she sets out to end up in the town of Kuriko, where she soon tries to find a use for her skills, in this case flying, um, as uh, she sets up a delivery service and soon embarking on a series of adventures as she soon be- warms herself to the hearts and minds of the local inhabitants. Uh, Kim, when it comes to Kiki's delivery service, I mean, is this one that you saw sort of early on in your exposure to the Studio Ghibli movies, or what's your sort of history with it? I mean, it's definitely not a first-time watch. Uh, I saw it fairly young, but it wasn't one of the first ones that I saw. But I've always yeah. really liked Kiki. Uh, I think it's it's such a it, it's such a charming little character as well. Like. She, I think that, you know, when you watch Studio Ghibli, one of the main things is there are so many fun young girl characters and their their portrayal is so is is so fun. Like when you're when you're young and you're watching them, you really connect to them, I think, because it's something that I guess you don't get as much because when you go to, say, watching Disney or something, as much as I love Disney princesses, um, there's there's a there's something that you know obviously you don't connect to until we get to something like Mulan which obviously connects to me my culture the most uh so you know (laughs) it it it, for for this it feels like you know you have a more grounded character in a fantasy landscape obviously there's a bit of fantasy and there's a bit of reality to it I guess definitely so I mean when it suddenly came to the use of magic uh, for example Mizaki wanted to keep it very sort of grounded and have it as a very limited talent so many of the witches that we encounter such as her mother um, and there's another witch that uh, she encounters on her journey to the town they all have like one skill that they sort of excel at her mother was uh, potion making Um, the witch that she encounters is um, a palm reader and a fortune teller and um her ability is she's a little unsure what her ability actually is um and she decides really that flying is the one thing that she can do so she basically uses her flying ability to help um the locals by setting up a delivery service as she sets up home really above the this bakery and really helps them with their deliveries as well as other deliveries in the town. And it's qu- it's a very whimsical tale, but at the same time, at least adds a little more threat than we saw with My Neighbor Totoro, mm-hmm. uh, which was just pure whimsy and <laughs> no threat at all. But um, I certainly appreciate what you were saying with like 
compared to like the Disney princess model. I mean, Mulan was always that very example because she's the one princess who doesn't need saving. She saves herself. Yeah. Everyone else has got to be like a male counterpart to save them or for them to be in some moment of peril. And I think it's something that they've sort of corrected as they've gone along and there's certain princesses who don't need saving as much. People like Ariel, for example. Um, and uh, Princess Penelope from Wreck-It Ralph. They're very sort of independent uh, characters compared to like the earlier model where you looked at like Cinderella and Snow White and yeah. Belle. And though Belle, I think, was also kind of on the edge because she had a real so she was able to sort of hold her own. Um, yeah, it was. It was Belle was kind of starting to be the flip because Beauty and the Beast came out in the nineties, obviously. So that was kind of having you know you started seeing a bit more of the the flip in the scale a little bit more. And now as we get more modern, there. Yeah, I mean, as you get to like Frozen, you don't really you know Elsa doesn't really need any saving. Um, and, you know, in many cases, there's not even a male counterpart for them. So <laughs> it's uh, it, it's interesting. When you watch this film, do you watch the sub or do you watch the dub of this one? Uh, much like other ones, I actually a lot of times watch these when I was young in the Cantonese dub. So I've never actually watched it. I think I watched okay. it once in the Japanese sub. <laughs> and then um, this time I watched it in the English dub. Um, all of them were pretty enjoyable. Obviously, when you watch the English dub, sometimes it's weird because you're looking at, like, I always have subtitles on, and yeah. the subtitles don't match the actual dialogue. So. <laughs> no, they all, match with the Jap- they all match with the Japanese dialogue. Exactly. Yeah, the I think with, when it comes to uh, Kiki's, I think, this, as I said already, this is one of those occasions where the sub I find superior to the dub. Um, in particular, I mean, the... Sorry, the dub is superior to the sub. I think that's right. Mm-hmm. Um, in particular, I mean, Kiki's voiced by Kirsten Dunst and Phil Hartman voices Gigi the cat, who has a much more playful, um, kind of a sarcastic personality to him, and he's a little more sort of serious and stuck up. He's also female, if you were watching the Japanese sub. Mm. Um, he also doesn't talk to her at the end. That was uh, pure, something that was added purely for the dub version. Um, I think they... Disney perhaps felt it was a little too harsh for uh, for the cat not to uh, talk to her when she regains all her magical powers, whereas in the Japanese viewpoint, it was seen as sort of like, you know, she's grown as a as a witch and she no longer needs um, her talking cat. She's able to sort of stand on her own. She doesn't need that sort of emotional support. And I always find it I always find it kind of sad that she, she didn't have a little buddy talk to her again, even though. He goes off and ha- like hooks up with the lo- one of the local cats and starts his family. <laughs> like, again, really kind of shocking for a Disney movie to, for that. And you remember, no, this was never created a Disney property. This was a Studio Ghibli property they were just distributing. So, her actual journey here of where she's got this real sort of clumsiness to herself. She's got she's a real sort of got this eagerness to sort of get out there and. And uh, have her own independence. At the same time, she's not. Um, she lacks a lot of sort of the finesse in her training, as we see when she flies off and she like crashes into the tree, and how she like handles her bl- broom and just her sort of erratic movements on it, compared to when we see um, the other young witch that she encounters, who's sort of like riding it perfectly, and the cat sitting all poised on the end of the broom. I thought it was. Mm-hmm. It makes her a much more interesting character. The fact that she is so imperfect i find yeah well i think that that's the case that's the thing with you know if you think about it a lot of studio ghibli starts with a more naive character and a naive well a lot of times the naive female character and then we grow from that it's always kind of like a coming of age story of some sort where they kind of grow with the things they encounter it's like this for this one and you know spirited away kind of is the same thing and you have a lot of different ones, which is, which is, which has that, some, especially as earlier stories, right? Because once you get to, like, Howls or something, that's not the same type of um, story anymore. Uh, but a lot of them is, is kind of, like, growth in the character. And for this one, I think Kiki grows the most because you really see her, um, like, it, even in the clumsiness, I think that's what makes it kind of stick to reality a lot because... You know, you can't expect in in despite all the whimsy and the magical stuff, 
she still has a lot to grow. Everybody has, like, a process to grow. It's like, you know, Harry Potter, right? You go to Hogwarts to improve yourself. Except this one, she's learning how to grow by herself. And in this, you know, one year by herself, that's what she has to do. She has to not only figure this out, but also kind of, I guess, sort out her own problems. Uh, you know, whether it's friends or, you know, just um, her, her, her self-esteem or self-confidence whatever you want to call it <laughs> well yeah i mean the certainly with her self-confidence that plays such a, a major role in um the film in particular yeah. the fact that her magical abilities are linked to her, her own confidence in herself and it's kind of charming as well the fact that because magic is not such a common thing in this world while witches are obviously known of they're not of that particularly common so you'll get characters who are aware that she's a witch and there are other characters who've never seen a witch before and we have like the scene when she like arrives in town and i'm always i'm always interested to see where people will sort of place this town because i for myself it reminds me very much of like uh like the italian seaside from like from movies like life is strange and stuff and i've had other people like steven love on uh the ac film club have talked say that like placed it being more like in france so when it came to the the sort of town, did you have it? Is there any sort of particular place that you sort of place it as being at all? Or? <laughs> I don't know. When you were talking about it, I kind of it kind of reminded me of uh, the the Porco Rosso moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, you just imagine he's like flying somewhere in the background. Yeah, exactly. So I guess that's somewhere more European. I guess like in a more European country. Um, I don't know where to pinpoint it. I mean, it's by the seaside, so maybe, yeah, so maybe like France or whatnot. It, it, it would it would fit the bill, I'm sure. It's certainly got a very European feel to it compared to... Yes. Like when we look at, when we look at My Neighbor Totoro, which feels like this is very much Japan. Yeah. Or we like look at Pompoko. Uh, even things like Princess Mononoke, they're very much like, okay, I mean... Japan, I mean rural Japan. Whereas this one, and certainly in the case of Porco Rosso, that like um, more European, and I would say the same as well for the Pewter Castle in the Sky as well. Um, certainly the the town sequences they felt very European as well. Yes, yeah. Well, I mean this one, I if you if you think about it, like the fact that she goes to a bakery i'm not saying japan doesn't have bakeries okay don't get me wrong but i'm just saying like you know when you look at the bakery itself it's making things like you know like baguettes and yes. loaves of bread and stuff like that right so it's it has that i think that's how you get this kind of like french vibe to it because that's how we know right um that that those are you know pastries that are specific to to france itself so i mean that 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 that's what i think oh yeah of course <laughs> Um, the bakery that she uh, lives across um, direct uh, is uh, owned by uh, Otsuno. And um, is he her husband? I can never really make out what the relationship with the big burly baker. It's her husband. He doesn't, he doesn't really speak much, but he has the best relationship with uh, Gigi. He just sort of like smiles, smiles at him with this big, like, big grin. And he's like, Arr! I think I think that's what it is. I think that's the essence of, you know, like, they're trying to kind of bring in that Japan or maybe like the Asian type of culture where where fathers don't really, you know, or maybe even, I don't know, I only have my own culture yeah. to base it on, right? Cause, but, I mean, like fathers who are kind of hard on the outside, like they're, they don't say a lot, but they're actually very sweet. And that's how he is, right? You know, he pops out and then like he makes that whole sign for Kiki. And that's a really nice moment where he makes that whole sign and he's actually standing there waiting for her to come home. And when she gets there, he like runs to the back and <laughs> hides. <laughs> and then he'll come out. And, <laughs> and then the, and then he's like so shocked and she, she gives him a hug or something. And it's, uh, it, it, it's really nice. Yeah, and... This is also the scene where we get to the obviously the mandatory cleaning sequence. Because, you know, <laughs> Mizaki loves to have young girls clean things. In this case, uh, she has to clean the this bedroom that uh, she's given. And it, I always like the fact that when these you see these characters, they have these rooms. They're always like, while they're obviously dirty, they're always these like fantastical spaces. It's never just like some... Mm. 
some uh, pokey little back room or something. It's always like this wonderful, like, open space, and they've got the veranda there and stuff, and it's like, so it's better than my first place. Well, it's like living with 14 Whoa. Polish people in a six-bedroom six flat. <laughs> um, yeah, my landlady, she, she rented by the room, and the Polish guys, they would, like, sleep for three to four guys in a room. Um, they were very close. So... <laughs> but um, Luella's obviously meeting Osano. Um, she meets a young painter called Ursula, um, who has a weird friendship with the crows. I mean, she's uh, voiced by Ginny Garofalo, which is always a good thing. Um, another interesting character in Ursula, I mean, Ursula's obviously so key to it, went late in the film into helping Kiki get over what she classifies as like her version of an artistic block when she loses her powers um and i was very surprised that a character that she meets just on a whim like in the middle of the woods uh would become so key to the story as well true i mean ursula is an interesting character i think that if you talk about like whimsy and like the most whimsical whimsical character she would definitely qualify and it's weird because she seems like she's just such a, you know, like such a down to earth person that kind of keeps Kiki in, you know, in this kind of, you know, like, like encouraging her to be herself, but um, maybe even something like a mentor yeah. to her. But at the same time, also, you know, giving her a dose of, I don't know, a little bit of reality, I guess. But at the same time, she seems to be in her own space also. <laughs> That's why she lives in the woods, you know, and she's she's very self-sustaining and, you know, she she draws pictures of the crows like they're her best friends and stuff. Um, it, it, it She's a very odd character. Uh, and even though she doesn't show up a lot, it she does. Um, she does make an impact, especially in, in Kiki's story. Well, she's so key to helping her find this uh, wooden cat uh, that that Gigi has to stand, stand in for as uh, <laughs> one of her uh, first liveries goes uh, wrong. So Gigi's left standing in as this uh, this toy cat for this spoiled child. And the, again, Gigi has his own little mini adventure where he's trying to disguise himself as this uh, this toy when this when the the uh, kid's dog comes along and you see these wonderful like masses of sweat lines as he's like like panicking that he's going to be exposed <laughs> and this dog just like picks him up and puts him outside this big dopey thing that it is so and to get these are all just like so many little charming moments in in the film the film that i just really love and i think this is what warms it to everyone is that it has these it does i don't mean really, the thing i think what it warms everyone to it is the fact it's not dumbing itself down it's just it is what it is and everything just happens to be really charming at the same time um it's not like she's doing these oversaturating things it's just like kiki is just a very good natured person but at the same time she's kind of a klutz so she falls into that sort of disney princess sort of mode in so many places but at the same time she's very much um her own person she's um the story that she's taking is, is much more realistic, sort of slant. It's not just sort of like, oh, let's just throw charming things at it. And isn't this is her in a pretty dress in a pretty situation and stuff? It's like, no, she's out there trying to make a way in the world. She's trying to set up a delivery business. She's a she's a go getter, but at the same time, she's a klutz, which is where the charm of the movie comes from. But you know, I think that what's really nice about Kiki is that. When you look at her character and the way she... There's a lot of things that goes into her character um, that kind of gives her, say, like, her work ethics, for example. And you're just watching her as, you know, she's like, oh, well, I I have to deliver this, you know, like the pie. Um, if you pay me, I have to do the work type of thing. And she's not taking advantage of anyone. And she's she she has really really great worth ethics and and it's not said or anything like uh, of of the character that she is but in her actions you can see a lot of positivity that's in there um no matter you know the 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 you know the ungratefulness say that when she delivers it or something obviously that kind of breaks her down a little 
when she realizes that she's, you know, she's delivering to this, this like, uh, this girl who doesn't appreciate her grandmother type of thing, and then she has she has to, and then she misses her own her own yeah. thing for it because of that, you know. So you see that kind of moment where she kind of, you. It's hard to say whether she's feeling sad because of everything combined together or if it's just, you know, for the fact that she can't go to a social event that, you know, she feels like she's getting into the society or, you know, like she's finding her group of friends type of thing. Yeah, I mean, there's so much of this film that is left open to the audience's interpretation of of why things are the way that they are. And I think this was also intentional mm-hmm. on the part of Mozaki who felt that, you know, hit the audience in particularly specified specified young girls who we I think he intended were his main audience for this film that they would just sort of figure it out on their own and he didn't want to put too many rules on on this world and this situation he just wanted to keep everything Mm -hmm. as vague as possible and I think that's certainly why it certainly works out works out well and you draw so much from the situation that she has and if you look at the book I mean it's again it's over the course of the year it's a number of um odd sort of adventures that she has like um we see the 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 lost uh toy cat which is uh we see in the film uh she saves a child from mm. the ocean uh, as she, uh during a day at the beach uh she has her broom stolen by a flying enthusiast which we'll certainly talk about in in a minute um and uh she posts for a portrait she delivers a belly warmer to a ship out at sea for an eccentric knitting old woman um she repairs the clock on new year's eve the very again the very sort of similar sort of adventures as we're seeing seeing here it's just the film decides to draw it back and keep it sort of more focused rather than just like here's a series of adventures she can be going on it's sort of like no we we have yeah. the the one or two uh, deliveries, just so we can show, you know, uh, that while she may have a business, she's still still kiki. Um, and then the film sort of like also brings in more the character of uh, Tombo, who's introduced yeah. with the rest of the Riverdale mob, um, as he rolls in in that old uh, <laughs> the old car, and he's instantly fascinated by Kiki because he's a flying enthusiast, and he's building his own flying machine, which is basically a bicycle with wings and a propeller. Um, really love to know the science behind that. <laughs> um, and at the same time, the world itself is is taking an interest in flight. I mean, in particular, there's a um, oh, I'm trying to think. Was it is it a zeppelin or a blimp? Um, oh, it's an airship, blimp. isn't it? So, yeah, it's an airship, um, yeah. And we have this big finale involving this uh, runaway airship, which she has to rescue Tombo from as he's uh, sort of hanging onto one of the mooring ropes. So that gives us our our peril uh, quota for the film. But what did you think of of Tombo? I don't know. Tombo is pretty fun. I think. I think in some ways, like Tombo is also a bit clumsy too. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's weird because I, whenever I think about Kiki's delivery service, I always forget about. He is Tombo. very forgettable. <laughs> he's also very non-threatening because he's just the nerdy yeah, yeah, kid. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, but it, but you know, like when you watch it, then you realize he's he's kind of a fun character also because you know as much as you know there there is absolutely probably no science behind the flying machine that he's <laughs> building um the concept of there being wings and 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 a propeller doesn't make it a flying Ooh. device <laughs> but it's it's still so cute because you this is like kind of the first moment where we have kind of a little bit it's more you know you can't tell whether they're building a friendship or a relationship, but then they're so young right now, right? So they just really like each other as friends because you know of of the of their fascination with uh, with flying, and I think that that's that's uh, it, it's nice. You know, I, I sometimes forget when Tombo is there that um, that they're thirteen mm. year old. 
<laughs> because, you know, he dresses up in a suit to pick her up to the thing and stuff. And um, I, it, it's very, very weird. It, it, it almost feels like they're older and he's trying to take her on a date yeah. or something, you know? Yeah, I think Tumbo is certainly more into Kiki than Kiki is into him. Um, in many ways, I always see like Tombo as being like the young Mirazaki. It's like another of his mm. autobiographical um, elements he's put into this movie, like yeah. the way that the sisters in uh, Totoro were representative of him and his brother. And the fact he only made him girls because it felt too painful to be that autobiographical. And certainly with uh, with Tombo, I mean, here we have the young boy obsessed with flying machines, uh, which is obviously a reoccurring theme in Mirazaki's work and I mean the flying elements in particular I think are where the film really shines and obviously where Miyazaki put his, a lot of his main focus uh, even spending a day at the park watching the wind blow women, women's skirts up so we could get those perfect uh, movements on Kiki's dress when she has like those downward moments where like her broom suddenly like drops mm-hmm. and you see her dress sort of flutter up right. yeah so yeah, but I mean, like Miyazaki, that that's the fa- that's a fascination of the animation that he makes, right? It's the it's like those little attention to details, and there there's you know not only is it just the dress, but there's so many different parts of this where even from like the cleaning scenes to to the 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 little um, I was wa- I was watching a part and I wanted to I forgot to write it down because I'm an idiot <laughs> <laughs> and. And uh, it was something that I, I thought that it was such great detail that he captured. And I can't remember for the life of me what it is. Um, but, yeah, I really should write things down. But, yeah, the, the point, you know, like you bring up such a great point because it, it is something that I think Miyazaki's charm is in his animation is all is always like this is where this is kind of maybe even I don't remember if this is one of his signatures but his attention to detail is, is so is so amazing sometimes that it, you don't you don't acknowledge it all the time but when you see certain things it almost makes it feel more realistic and you're watching a cartoon <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah i mean certainly when it comes to obviously the mizaki themes i mean environmentalism is the other one and in this case we see you know society living very much um in in turn with with nature i mean certainly in the case of like ursula who's obviously living out in the woods with her crows there's very little intrusion on the the modern world on the natural world it all seems to like slot in and be very um symbiotic so it's very down sort of played for and i think that's mainly because the fact he's got a whole movie which he can just do flying he can explore his obsession with flying so i think that's probably why he pushed down the environmental theme to this one even though like you know we're seen as sort of like crows are people too um (laughs) crows are apparently very intelligent um, which I found out recently, so that's all I got on that one. So <laughs> they they remember people. <laughs> I was told, so I was like, "Oh, great!" <laughs> so don't be mean to crows. Yeah, if happy. we didn't learn anything from the birds, it's <laughs> we know now. Exactly, and now and now we have an extra reasoning of why the birds was such a powerful movie and why maybe that's why crows are chosen, right? Yeah. <laughs> were the crows or ravens? Crows. Were the crows or ravens? I can't remember. Yeah. Crows, right? Well, There's yeah. the thing, a crow and a raven are so similar. I mean, who who can really tell the difference between a crow and a raven? It's just the size. It's true. <laughs> true. I think, I think you know, the only person who know where ravens are is like at Tower of London because they breed them up there. Um, but mm. I'm sure everywhere else that I, I see, it's always a crow. Like, you know, at the park or in the woods and stuff, it's always a crow, so. So, yeah, I think this Kiki's Living Service, um, it's a film that's still as charming as when I first saw it. I mean, th- this is, like, back when I was in college. This is, like, 2000, um, 2001, and you would be read on the internet, like, on, like, anime groups and not having a huge act. I mean, Amazon wasn't really a thing, so you, the only way you got hold of a lot of Amazon was like 
a lot of anime was like through tape trading and stuff and you would hear like anime groups like talk about like oh kiki's delivery service and fruits basket and there used to be like this this uh this mythical title that everyone was like talking about especially because they were all like american um they were based in like the states and they had access to like the streamline and the releases and like, the disney ones which we didn't we it was like much later that uh, they sort of filtered over here to the uk i think it was around 2005 i want to say that we finally got like all the ghibli movies sort of like filtered across and now they're wildly available i mean you can watch them on netflix or which i think is the true most i think it's hbo max in the states but and it's it's weird now the fact that like kids now like grow up and they watch like Ghib they watch Ghibli movies and be the same way they watch like Disney movies it's like a an extension of those movies so and I think Kiki's is certainly a it's a good entry point um, I know a lot of people say Totoro but I think uh, Kiki's is like if if you haven't seen a Ghibli movie I always like, recommend like Kiki's Livy Service it's like the first one that was Spirited Away maybe so mm, yeah. I do agree. I think that, I think that those two are really like there's a nice balance, right? Because my neighbor Totoro is even though you know for me I think it's one of it is one of my favorites because nostalgia plays a big part in it. Um, I do think that you know it is a more slow type of story and um, not you know there are things going on but it's more yeah. low key. Whereas, like, when you think about Kiki, Kiki is an adventure, basically. It's a coming-of-age adventure story. Um, even though it's a female character, you know, like, you, you, as a young girl, you still have, um, you know, you still have Tombo, and you still have the charming town that she's in, and the little things that she goes through. And they're, and it's not restricted to just, like, little girls, you know. you can Anybody can basically watch this and have a good time, I think. Um, same for Spirited Away. Yeah, and I think this thing with, with my neighbor Totoro, it's got such an iconic character design in there. Obviously, with like Totoro and the cat bus, um, it's just the story is so whimsical and abstract. And with this one, it obviously has it, it has more, the story is a lot more stronger. It has a, a clear direction and, you know, obstacles that Kiki has to overcome and a, a direction, an endpoint that she needs to get to. Whereas Totoro is sort of like, it's going to hang out in the woods with me and my big forest buddy. <laughs> so, which has its own own uh, challenge. But I would, I think that's the thing. I was like, when I saw my Totoro for the first time, as we said on, on the previous episode, it's sort of like, you build up in your head that like Totoro is going to be like this big character and he's just more just like this character who's there. <laughs> he's, um, his contributions is, is, um, are more limited than you would you would expect for for the film so especially being such right. a pop culture icon that he is so <laughs> cool uh, so yeah that was uh my neighbor oh, that was i almost said my neighbor kiki then but it's not uh, <laughs> that was kiki's delivery service a big recommend for myself i think it's the same for yourself kim Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, yes, if you haven't, if you for whatever reason you haven't checked out my key name, it, ah, can't get it out of my head now. I just keeps slipping. Uh, if you haven't checked out Kiki's Living Service, definitely go check it out. Give both the uh, the sub and the double um, a watch. Myself, I highly recommend the dub version. Um, although the this the sub, the will always be the purest who uh, sort of prefer it. But I think this is one of those rare occasions where the dub myself at least is uh is superior to the sub um so i would recommend uh checking that out and obviously if you watch this on netflix you've got access to all the tracks and uh languages so you can watch in whatever language you want and just uh compare them all for yourself um but uh kim where are we going to next on our reevaluation of the miyazaki filmography yeah, we're going to 1992 with Porco Rosso. Yes, Porco Rosso. We're still in the same, similar sort of town um, with a film that has the wonderful tagline, you will believe a pig can fly. As we look at World War II and biplanes and more flying machines and 
a very charismatic man pig. But that's obviously yeah. Mm-hmm. And pirates. I know. And, yeah, air pirates and stuff. So much to be excited for on this one. I thought it was actually later in the filmography, so this is a delight that we get to look at such an underrated one so uh, so early on in the season. I have, you know, I have I have mixed feelings about it, so it'll be a fun yeah. discussion. Um, if you haven't done already, please do hit the like and subscribe button wherever you happen to be listening to us. Please uh, do hit that like and subscribe button, leave us a review, let us know what you think of the show. You can check out our blog, which is Moves and Tea Podcast at WordPress.com. Um, and you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Come say hi to us there. And, uh, you know, let us know your thoughts on the Mozaki filmography. Let us know your favourites. Let us know your favourite characters and uh, thoughts on tonight's film. But um, until then, thank you for listening. Thanks to my co-host Kim. And we'll be back next time to talk about Poco Russell. Until then, good night. Mm-hmm.